the, uh, the Romans were incredible engineers, uh, and one of their famous contributions that they made were, of course, roads. Uh, we know about Roman roads. Uh, they conquered and connected the world through the engineering of their roads. And when I was in Rome last year, uh, can we, oh, I got it, there we go, okay. Uh, when I was in Rome last year, I uh, thought I'd better check out some of their roads, um, do some quality testing. And um, yeah, so I hired myself a bike and traveled along what's known as the Via Appia or the Appian Way, um, an old famous road, um, one of the earliest uh, and most strategically important Roman roads founded in 312 BC. And um, my honest assessment was they could have made it probably a bit smoother. Uh, as you can see, it's a bit bumpy in places and I was feeling pretty sore the next day. Um, but no, it's, it's a famous road and it's also famous for another reason. In 71 uh, BC, after two years of fighting, uh, the Roman general Pompey uh, defeated a slave revolt um, it, by, led, by the na uh, led by a man named Spartacus. You might have heard of or seen the old movie, um, this, this slave revolt. And um, after defeating this army, uh, they lined up all the remaining soldiers and crucified them along this long stretch of road. And the reports say there were 6,000 people crucified along this 200, along 200 kilometre stretch of road. Um, and uh, if I oh, go to the next one, um, the, yeah, these 6,000 people crucified uh, lining this road and, you know, it would not have been a pleasant journey to, to make that week along that road um, facing all these crucifixes and, um, but, um, yeah, the message would have been clear and, and that is in large part the point of crucifixion. Um, the Romans brought their engineering prowess to bear on their executions as well. Crucifixion was designed to be painful. It's, it's where we get our word excruciating from. It was designed to be painful, but it was also designed to be public and to be humiliating. It was to make an example of people, putting them on display for all to see what Rome will do to people who rebel. So don't mess with us or you might end up there yourself. It was a deterrent. But as uh, horrific and iconic as the crucifixions of Spartacus and his slave armies might have been, that's not what we tend to think of when we think of the cross. In fact, you know, many people were executed on Roman crosses in, in the ancient world, but we don't take it to mean anything significant for us or for our world. They have passed into history. Um, and that same General Pompey who, who conquered Spartacus's um, slave armies would go on to conquer Jerusalem uh, a number of a few years later um, for Rome and it was there 100 years later that another man would be uh, crucified and nailed to a Roman cross. The sign above his head to mock him, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That is the cross that we remember on Good Friday. That is the symbol that lies at the centre of our Christian faith and, um, and message. And that is the cross that we see represented in so many ways in, in the world around us. Um, so what is it about this cross which has made such an impact? Because it seems like a bit of a strange symbol to us to put at the centre of our faith. You know, what kind of king dies on a cross? And we're so familiar with the image of a cross that maybe it's hard for us to, to grasp how shocking um, and strange the message really is. That the image at the centre of our faith is the degradation and humiliation of our God. And I want to take you to another place in in Rome, right uh, into the heart of the city, uh, the Palatine Hill, where one of the earliest depictions that we know about of Jesus and his crucifixion was found, etched into the plaster of a wall uh, in 200 AD. And it looks like this. Uh, you can see there um, a man on a cross, although you might notice something different about this man. He has the head of a donkey. Uh, another man standing next to him with his hand raised in worship to this person on the cross. 
And the inscription below it reads, Alexamenos worships his God. And we don't really know much about Alexamenos. We don't know who he was, but we know that he was um, the butt of this joke, um, obviously, and um, a source of ridicule and mocking for his Christian faith. That, you know, this guy worships a crucified God, a crucified Messiah. What kind of God, what kind of Messiah is that? It's a joke. It's, you know, this um, donkey-headed person. Um, and um, this is how the message of Christianity sounded in the ancient world. You know, how can a crucified man be the Messiah, be God? Um, and the Apostle Paul, a man who gave his life to preach this message of the cross, um, says, in a sense, the, the same thing in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He writes uh, in verse 22, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. You know, the cross seems absurd. It doesn't make sense. It confuses and confounds and confronts us. How can we believe in such a thing? Even, you know, that we would gather to remember the crucifixion of this man and call it Good Friday. Christ crucified is a stumbling block, an offence to the Jews, or maybe today we might say to, to the religious people, to the religious mind, and foolishness to the Greeks, to the secular or the educated thinkers. Um, the Anglican priest Fleming Rutledge writes that religious people want visionary experiences and spiritual uplift. Secular people want proofs, arguments, demonstrations, philosophy, science. The striking fact is that neither one of these groups want to hear about the cross. The cross is not a suitable object of devotion for religious people and the claims made for it are too extreme to be acceptable to secular people. But, Paul goes on, but, there's a but in there. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, whom has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Um, Paul seems to be letting us in on the real joke, and it's the other way around that God has made a joke of our human wisdom and our human strength, or what's seen as wise and strong in the eyes of the world. This, the cross strips us of our pride, uh, what we may claim or cling to or boast about in ourselves, things that we um, set us above others, whether that's wisdom or strength. But um, the message of the cross, our redemption comes through the weakness and foolishness of the cross. It's not reserved for the best and the brightest. It's for sinners in need of grace. It's not by anything we're able to bring to the table, but what Christ has done for us, which means it's open for all of us. So we have nothing left to boast in or glory in, but um, like Paul says, to boast in Christ and him crucified. What kind of God is a crucified God? It's a God who is willing to give up his life as a ransom for many, who is willing to sacrifice himself, to choose weakness and humility, the harder path to take for the sake of love and reconciliation. A God who is not distant or disinterested from our human condition, from the evils and injustices of our world, from the problem of sin, the reality of our pain and our suffering, 
but he chooses to enter into it, to take it upon himself and to transform it from within, to take on himself the scorn, the shame, the mocking, um, so that we might um, be saved, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves because that's the kind of God he is. What kind of God is a crucified God? He is the only God who is truly worthy of worship and who can and who can only truly be understood as the crucified God, where he is revealed to us. So this morning on Good Friday, we join uh, with Alexa Menos, with the generations of Christians throughout the centuries who have been mocked or scorned or you know, considered foolish for this message that we believe, the centre of our faith, the, the cross and how ridiculous it seems. Um, but to those who are being saved, it is the power and the wisdom of God that we know the truth in the cross and um, the power of the cross in our own lives. So we boast and proclaim the foolishness and weakness of the cross where we find our righteousness and holiness and redemption in Christ. So we finish now with an invitation to come around the cross again um, and centre ourselves on the cross as we come to communion, the Lord's Supper, and remember Jesus' body and his blood given for us, represented in the bread and the juice, which Jesus invites us to take and to eat, to take into ourselves, into our deepest parts, to remember what he has done for us, freeing us from both the power and the penalty of sin, which had enslaved and condemned us. And uh, as we do so as well, we are to live lives that are determined by the cross and defined by the cross, to take up our own cross and follow Jesus, and um, to become more like him, um, who revealed himself on the cross for us, um, to be people who are broken and poured out um, like he was for our world, for the sake of others, um, defined by his love for us. So we're going to do Come Forward Communion this morning. We have a table set up here and a table set up there. And uh, over the next uh, song that uh, Nat and Hannah are going to sing for us, uh, just a time to, again, centre ourselves around the cross, to come forward and to remember what Jesus has done for us this Good Friday, to enter into that story and this um, in <laughs> radical, crazy message that you know what was a symbol of defeat and shame and suffering um, through Jesus has become... A uh, symbol of our redemption and of victory because, as we know, death wasn't the end, but Sunday is coming. But let's just take the moment now to, to pray and centre ourselves around the cross as we share in communion together. Our Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. Thank you that you chose to step into our world, Lord, because that's the kind of God you are, that you saw us, um, in our brokenness, in our fallenness, in our sin. You saw the evils and injustices in our world. You saw all of that, and Lord, you chose to step into that. You chose to take that on yourself, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, um, to be seen as weak and foolish, mocked, um, and uh, seen as shameful and, and scorned, and Lord, all of that. Um, taking our place for us. And Lord, um, we find in that true life and redemption and reconciliation that you did that for us so that we might be brought back to life in you. So we come with a sense of um, humility, Lord, knowing that um, it's, it's not our wisdom, it's not our strength, but Lord, it is in the cross that we have our redemption, that we are brought to new life. And Lord, I pray that that truth would um, go down into our deepest parts. We would know that in our bones, Lord, and the truth of your cross and what that means for us, and that that would change and transform us to be people defined and determined by your cross. Um, 
to our world around us. So, Lord, we come and we say thank you um, and we remember you and what you did for us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.